In collaboration with the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston, Asia Society, Texas, and the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce for Greater Houston, the Ismaili Jamatka and Center is pleased to present this exciting program highlighting the impact of Nizamuddin Urban Renewal Initiative led by Aga Khan Trust for Culture India in New Delhi. The Ismaili Jamatkanas around the world are more than places of worship and spiritual search. These places hope to encourage community engagement and collaboration on issues of concern, as well as broadening intellectual horizons and even fostering an appreciation of pluralism through arts and cultural events. As His Highness the Aga Khan, spiritual leader of the Ismaili Muslims, has explained, quote, these are places where Ismailis and non-Ismailis, Muslims and non-Muslims, will gather for shared activities, seminars and lectures, recitals and receptions, exhibitions, and social events. But they will also, we trust, be filled with the sounds of enrichment, dialogue, and warm human rapport as Ismailis and non-Ismailis share their lives in a healthy, gregarious spirit." End quote. Today's event features a brief presentation by Ratish Nanda, followed by a discussion moderated by Sultana Mangalji. Ratish is a conservation architect who currently serves as the CEO of Aga Khan Trust for Culture in India, also referred to as AKTC. He heads the multidisciplinary AKTC teams presently undertaking two major urban conservation projects in India. The Nizamuddin Urban Renewal Initiative in Delhi and the Kut Shahi Heritage Park Conservation in Hyderabad. For AKTC, he was earlier responsible for the Bagababur restoration in Kabul, Afghanistan and the garden restoration of Humayun's tomb. Hello, I'm Ratish Nanda. I work for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in India. Um, for the last almost 25 years, uh, we've been engaged with the Government of India, the Archaeological Survey of India, to work on this magnificent site of Humayun's mausoleum. Uh, it all started in 1997 as uh, His Highness the Aga Khan uh, gifted to India the garden restoration of Humayun's tomb on the 50th anniversary of India's independence. Uh, he had similarly on the 25th anniversary of India's independence gifted the Aga Khan Palace in Pune to the government of India. That is now today a national monument. Uh, but this, this, this project was unique. This gift was unique. And uh, we have continued to work on this site in a much broader manner that I will talk to you about today. Um, so the Nizamuddin area really sits in the heart of the national capital of Delhi and uh, um, is, um, is uh, you know, traces its descent, it traces its history to almost 700 years. So it's been 700 years of almost continuous, um, continuous existence. And during this time, almost everybody to have built in, to have built in, um, India, built in Delhi or ruled Delhi, built over here. Um, so along the river Yamuna, in close proximity to the Darga of Hazrat Nizamuddin Aulia, has been a Mughal royal necropolis from the 14th century till almost the 19th century. So this is how the place would have looked uh, up till the 19th century. Um, this is how Homayun's tomb really looked. Um, when we started, so my tomb. Uh, this is this is a photograph that was taken around 1997. It's it's a photograph I use often because uh, of what uh, what we did is so easily visible in the photograph that I'm going to show next. So this was the before and after, and in the before picture, um, you will notice that uh, not only was a lot of work done on the um, on the on the water flow, but also in terms of removing inappropriate uh, inappropriate uh, vegetation, but also the Ashoka trees at the back, the waterfalls covered with layers and layers of cement, 
um, and structures such as the platform under the tree almost dilapidated. That was transformed to that and immediately within a year led to a thousand percent increase in visitor numbers. Uh, we also planted about 3,000 trees, uh, hand chiseled two kilometers of sandstone, restored flowing waters, discovered five wells, discovered incredible lots of archaeology, aqueducts, wells, and so on, and really understood the site. We finished in 2002 and left the site. It was in 2004 that the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, then requested His Highness the Aga Khan for continued public-private partnerships in the field of culture in India. And the government of India offered us about uh, 50 projects, 50 sites to work on. And after looking at plenty of them, we chose to come back, um, come back to Humayun's tomb. Uh, to do a large urban conservation project. Why did we come back to Humayun's tomb is, is, a, is a question that has been asked several times. But critically, we were, um, all of you would be familiar with the work that the Aga Khan Trust for Culture has done at al -Azhar Park in Cairo. And we were looking for a model wherein we could combine a grand site with the potential of creating a new city park and benefit a social large sort of economically or social economically deprived population and that we found the possibility of doing that um, in the heart of the national capital building upon the work we had done before so since then um, in the last 15 odd years uh, we finally signed this in 2007 we've we've uh, fixed about 60 monuments most of them some of them dating back to the 14th century We've landscaped over 200 acres of land, and we've benefited uh, not only the population of Nizamuddin Basti, which is about 20,000 people, but uh, several hundred thousand more. And I will show you all of that in the next few slides. Um, for those of you who haven't visited this incredible site, hope you will do so soon. But this is Humayun's tomb. Fortunately, it sits in a large green space. Uh, but Humayun's tomb is not alone. It, it, it sits with several other monuments um, that we were able to secure World Heritage status for in 2016. The reason you have 100 plus monuments in this area is this shrine. It's, it's the Darga of Hadrat Nizamuddin Aulia, 14th century Sufi saint. And it's considered, in India, it's considered auspicious to be buried near a saint's grave. So Profusion of tomb building happened here for over five centuries, including several Mughal emperors. And then finally, this big space, which was which was almost a wasteland, uh, we've converted into a city park, Sundar Nursery, and 580,000 visitors have come in 2021 alone, uh, even though three months the park was closed because of the pandemic. Um, so what all, we, we of course, you know, we were of course, um, uh, keen to carry on the work that we'd done during the garden restoration to the major mausoleum itself. And uh, almost almost uh, from the top, from the finial to the foundations, every bit of it needed extensive care. Um, in the good old days when this was built, it would probably took eight to nine years to, uh, to build. And we required a similar amount of time to really fix um, fix the building. And we had the support of the Tara Trust. Uh, we've been able to build a lot of other partnerships, which I will mention later. And um, we, we used the opportunity to really carry out a model project uh, for the Indian context, a model conservation project of a national monument of a World Heritage Site um, in a manner that would be appropriate in the in the Indian context. And we introduced uh, significant scientific uh, advancement in conservation. We, for example, 15 years ago, introduced uh, the laser scanning technology invented uh, to really detect leaks in nuclear plants to measure and uh, document historic buildings. Believe it or not, this has become par for the course in India over the last uh, decade. Uh, we made sure our work was uh, Closely scrutinized, we invited experts from world across to uh, judge what we were doing, to review what we were doing and what we were planning to do. And this is the key sort of keystone to our work. We uh, have over the last uh, 12, 13 years, um, about 1.4 million man days or uh, days of work by master craftsmen um, to restore um, these sites 
in the same material, in the same building craft technique, in the same, um, uh, you know, material and uh, the material, the craft techniques that were used several centuries ago. So this is a craftsman doing incised plaster work. Lots of other crafts that I will talk about as 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 I show you some more slides. So the dome was leaking. We fixed this, um, and there were lots of things about the monument that we didn't understand, that nobody understood till we started this project. For example, this 19th century image, even though the monument is predominantly red and white, the contrast red and white, um, the in this the, you see these canopies really uh, have this teardrop blue. And this is obviously a very important intention of the Mughals who were using the glazed tile as a reminder of homes. Uh, they came from Samarkand, Timurid capital. That was obviously the ob always the desired capital for the Mughals. And they tried to bring a bit of Samarkand into Delhi by using these tiles. But when we reached the monument, this is the condition it was in. This was one craft that was lost to India. But we were able to discern patterns that originally existed and then uh, invite craftsmen from Uzbekistan to really train local youth and revive a lost craft. So this has been very successful. And um, I mean, I'm not going to show you the whole 60 monuments, but what I'm going to try to do here is really show key points of, of what we did. This is another one of the earliest Mughal buildings in Delhi called the Nila Gumbad. Um, obviously very important, was originally built on a river island and predates Humayun's tomb by almost about 30 years. And this is the condition it was in. Uh, to cut a long story short, about 15 years of work, and we were able to rehouse about 200 plus families, uh, relocate a road, uh, a major vehicular road, and eventually, about three years ago, restore the linkage with Humayun's tomb and half of the garden setting of the monument. You can see on the top left corner of the picture that there are railway tracks. So half of the monument garden was really lost uh, in the mid 19th century when the railway tracks were laid. But this this itself was quite, a, quite an achievement to be able to secure uh, world heritage status for this building as well in 2016. Now, this is a random shot taken at a random time to just demonstrate uh, the number of craftspersons, women and men, uh, who the project employs at any given time. This was just one sunny day where we said, let's take a photograph of all the craftsmen. So over the last 15 years, we've, we've at any given time employed between 100 to 700 craftsmen on this project. And almost 85, 90% of what we spend on conservation goes into craftsmen wages. Now, the key, one of the key reasons, I mean, a lot of people think we're working on Humayun's tomb, so we are benefiting or working with the community in Nizamuddin to improve the quality of life. It's not really so. Uh, we could say we're working on Humayun's tomb because this is an associated community and community that has been associated with this site for almost 700 years. And uh, so a lot of our efforts almost, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to do about, 30% of our effort goes into conservation of the 60 plus monuments that we fixed. But 30% also goes into building the Sundar Nursery, the city park that we built, and 30%. So it's almost equally divided in the Delhi project of our efforts between social economic development, landscape, and creating a city park, and conservation of historic buildings. So this is a historic settlement. The earliest buildings date from the 13th century. And uh, most of you are familiar with this, but this is this is uh, why we do what we do. Um, often, I mean, since the 1970s, His Highness has stressed on how culture can be used as a leverage um, to uh, improve quality of life, just in the same way as the Aga Khan Education Services uses education or the Aga Khan Health Services uses health. Basically, culture as a potential leverage to improve quality of life in communities that live in historic urban cities. This is a 14th, early 14th century step well. And um, notice that this is a picture from 2008. Uh, notice on the bottom left, um, if my mouse is visible, uh, part of this collapsed in 2008. And mind you, behind this arcade is a passage 
where which is used by about 4 million people every year to access the main shrine at the back. And right below this, all of this caved in. We could never shut down the passage because that's the way it is. And uh, and there are 80 people living just atop that building. And under these circumstances, uh, this was a major challenge. Uh, mind you, we had not really started, even though we'd signed the MOU in 2007, but the first year we had not really started doing any or even talking about conservation work in, um, in the Basti because people feel threatened. Uh, there were previous attempts at uh, relocating this whole community for the sake of the heritage. And... Uh, uh, people felt very threatened that we were going to get involved with the ASI and so on. So for the first year and two, we were only focused on health and education. But when this collapsed, uh, we were able to sort of start talking about this. And um, and we built alternate houses for all of these people living atop the Bauli. And one of the com conditions the community placed on us was to clean the step. Well, they said, if you want to fix it first, you clean it. And we had to manually lift because all the machines failed. Manually lift about 60 feet, uh, 40 feet of sludge accumulated over centuries um, to really clean this and go back into the original foundations. This is this is an image of the Bauli. This is also slightly dated. We've done more work since then, but I didn't want to go on and on about this. Other urban areas in the Nizamuddin Basti, um, like this Nala, have been transformed with a lot. Of, and the paint layer is the last bit, but this took about 10 years of effort because everybody, each one of those houses was really dumping all their waste onto the wasteland. We removed 400 trucks of waste every year for about three years till we reach tipping point. And we got the community to really keep it like this. Um, we had to, in the process, get children involved. We had to in, institutionalize a waste collection system, which now the community pays for in full. When we started, it, we were paying for it in full. Um, these were some of the parts. Mind you, when we did our first baseline survey, we realized that less than 1% of the local population had been to any sort of park in the past one year. So it, and, and then we found these little patches, which were in the plan supposed to be green, but this is how they were being used. A lot of effort, a lot of uh, engagement with the community, a lot of uh, engagement to understand what they needed. And these parks have been transformed, uh, transformed five of these smaller parks. They're not posted site stamp. Uh, mind you, this is a community of 20,000 people. So any green space is important and valuable. So this is, this is what has happened there since. Um, we built a municipal primary school. Uh, this is a municipal school. It existed on the site, but was uh, in 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 not in a usable condition, to put it politely. Um, Six hundred kids enroll here every year, so we've seen about five thousand kids over the last ten years. Um, every kid goes through computer education, arts and education, which is unheard of in municipal schools in Delhi, and um, and then uh, another key problem we we realized was the health problem. We realized that women were dying in childbirth. We realized uh, that um, health seeking behavior was very, very poor. So we set up a path lab and the path lab, uh, uh, this figure is 457,000. It's now over 600,000 individuals have accessed the path lab. Now, mind you, the local population is only 20,000. So the UMA, from across Delhi is really coming here to get free tests done. And uh, this is a municipal path lab. Uh, a lot of these facilities, including placement of doctors such as gynecologists and uh, specialist doctors, eyes and so on, have now been taken over the municipality as we um, are in the process of sort of winding down the project or uh, completing the project. Now, long, I mean, some of you might have heard about the emphasis uh, this government did in its last term on cleaning India. And one of the things was uh, public toilets. And we built this long before uh, it, was, it was mandated by the government of India. Now, we realized that 25% of the community had no in-home toilets. And then, again, there are these four to five million pilgrims every year. So this was a big toilet facility that we built. Um, uh, we found that less than less than nine percent of the youth had any sort of economic opportunities. So we created a lot of vocational training opportunities for them, including in the conservation efforts such as this. 
uh, crafts that women could make, very popular now. And this is a group I'm extremely proud of. These were domestic workers, domestic uh, workers cleaning people's houses and so on. We established them into a kitchen. Their kebabs are today sought after to the extent that these women who'd never stepped out of the house have since been in, flown down from Delhi to Mumbai to Hyderabad to manage kitchens of five-star hotels for a week or so as part of a special invitation. So very proud of these, this lot. Uh, we've trained local youth to become heritage guides um, and they do a lot of work. They walk around 30 to 40,000 people a year uh, through the sites. And these women were really saviors during COVID. The first time COVID struck, uh, Nizamuddin was a epicenter or a, uh, you know one of those hot spots because of the Tablighi Jamaat headquarters. Uh, but we made sure not one person in the Basti in the settlement got COVID for the first uh, first wave for nine months or so. Um, all of this uh, led in December, just last month, uh, to UNESCO to recognize this effort with twin awards, uh, both a special recognition for sustainable urban development and an award for excellence for conservation. Uh, we're very proud of it. It's a huge ratification, which which really helps where we work. And finally, the last six seven minutes that I have um, to talk about this, uh, you know, the city park that we created. So uh, this is right north of a milestone, a stretch of about ninety acres now. It was sixty seven acres when we started, um, and um, a space that was really enclosed in the early 20th century to experiment with plants for the British capital of New Delhi. Um, so this was really a plant nursery and over time had become a dumping ground for construction rubble. Heart of Delhi, not open to the public. And uh, again, as we know, uh, we've been building parks across the world in Afghanistan, several parks in Kabul, in Syria, in uh, Mali, in uh, Edmonton, um, and uh, of course, Kabul, uh, I've already said Kabul, Zanzibar and so on. So um, there is a new book um, coming out, I think, uh, later this month on all the park projects that AKTC has done. Um, but it's wonderful to now see that all of this vision that His Highness has had for the parks is now being fulfilled at Sundar Nursery. Um, so this, this, as I said, was 67 acres. We were able to remove along the way almost 20 acres of encroachment. So Sundar Nursery is now 90 acres. It boasts of 20 monuments, six of which were in 2016 added to the World Heritage List. And we've, we've now planted over 300 tree species here. We attract about 100 species of birds, butterflies. It's a hot spot for dragonflies. So a lot of ecological um, um, things are really fitting in. Professor Mohammad Shahir was the landscape architect. He unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He was also the landscape architect of the Bage Babur restoration. And these were the three things that, uh, that uh, you know, the, the built up uh, heritage, the, the large trees, many of which existed, and nursery functions that were integrated into a single master plan. These are some views of Sundar Nursery from earlier last year. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the heart of Sundar Nursery, what we call the Gardens of Delight, um, with, clearly inspired by the Persian and the Mughal landscape features. We have lakes, which, which are very popular with visitors. These uh, lakeside banks are usually full of people. And this was the portion of land that was encroached. We were able to remove it and add some of these monuments to the World Heritage World Heritage List. And again, in 2020, we got the same twin awards. Uh, mind you, it's yes, we've got them twice in a row, but it's not not uh, not usual that uh, any project gets twin awards and completely unusual. I don't think it's ever been done that the same part of the same project wins the, both the awards two years running. So very proud of that ratification, especially needed in India, where we we're trying to uh, trying to promote or showcase another way of doing conservation, which is which is you know uh, meaningful for Indian society. Conservation that leads to also intangible heritage such as craft skills, but also to improve quality of life for neighboring communities. 
So this was on the left is a picture of the World Heritage Site when we started. It was 20, it was uh, six hectares. Today, the World Heritage Site is 27 hectares, almost five times um, the expansion, almost five times what it was uh, when we started the project. And these are some of the other monuments, six of which are in Sundar Nursery, which, which have been since, uh, since we started, since we conserved these sites, added on the World Heritage List. Finally, um, ecological uh, interventions were very important to us, and we're sort of victim of our own success in some ways. Uh, but this was this was the construction rubble dump at Sundar Nursery, which has now become a real biodiversity, a wilderness area, a hotspot. And to the extent that people have now filed public interest litigations in court to protect legally protect uh, this wilderness. Uh, without realizing that it is a design windowless, it is something that we've uh, created over a very short period of span, just 10 years, um, and, and to create these urban forests of great value to the city, attracting over 100 species of birds, as I've already said, several species of butterflies. And one of the things that we've been able to do is significant programming. Um, and uh, so we get a lot of school children, of course, pre-COVID, uh, we do we do a lot of work around bees, around butterflies, around organic farming, and so on. And really, the last, last, last bit of my presentation is we're building a museum uh, called the Humayun's Tomb Site Museum. It's a 10,000 square meter facility, very ambitious that we've, um, you know, I don't know whether we've bitten off more than we can chew on this one. Um, and uh, the buildings are nearly complete. Uh, nearly complete uh, and uh, this is the facilities block uh, which is key part to our post project sustainability efforts these spaces will be cafes and souvenir shops and so on um, this is the gallery block which is totally underground seven meters below ground and on the top just there's just a landscape plaza that you use to enter from the uh, Humayun's tomb this is one of the biggest, the biggest single gallery that it will be in India. It's, uh, it's where, uh, and there are several galleries in the gal in the block, which, uh, which it's not a traditional museum. It really started off by being an interpretation center. So it will include films, digital screenings, animations. We have had the good fortune of receiving antiquity from the National Museum. We've got architectural replicas and a lot of architectural. Uh, models. Uh, we've, 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 we will be able to display several Mughal miniatures that have never been seen before, uh, including the original uh, objects, including the original finial of a Mayan's tomb. But those are the three key things of the museum. Um, the, the significance of a Mayan's tomb and the Sufi aspect and the personalities of this area, uh, including Rahim and Dara Shikho. We will have a 270 degrees view and this is what we hope the museum will look like uh, later this year funds covid permitting mm -hmm. 200 pieces of uh, antiquities some of them have never really been seen before they're from the storage of astral labs and so on it's really telling the story of uh, pluralism and the mughal dynasty um and this we believe and strongly believe that will really really um help uh, people understand who the Mughals really were. Uh, for example, uh, you know, this finial, uh, the center picture really comes from Hindu temples. The Mughal builders incorporated that in, in the design. And similarly for the canopies, they really came from Rajput funerary architecture. And really it's it's the Humayun's tomb itself, through the architecture, we can talk about pluralism, which remains one of AKDN's prime uh, objective. Um, and um, you know things like that which and this is the darga and how it's evolved so it's really making it possible and again to do something like this uh, we need the interdisciplinary team we have about 30 disciplines on this team have always had so and and this is only possible uh, with his highness the aga khan's vision i don't think any other agency doing any sort of work in india will have so many different people different disciplines on one team and finally, last slide, we're doing a large project in Hyderabad, doing it for seven, eight years now, um, but that's for another day, another talk. Um, building partnerships, we signed this agreement with three different government agencies, which have 
really very different mandates. But because we signed with three government agencies, we've been able to do this really diverse amount of work. And over the years, we built partnerships with government agencies, with national and international trusts, with corporates such as Havels, and with international ministries. So we've had a lot of support from Norway, from the US Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation, and Germany. So that has really helped achieve these very, very ambitious objectives of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ratish, for that insightful presentation. I would like to welcome Sultana Mangalji to lead us into a conversation with Ratish. Sultana has been and continues to be a leader in many civic society organizations in Houston and around the world. Sultana was named one of Houston's 50 most influential women by the Houston Women Magazine in 2011. Her current leadership roles include several impactful organizations, such as the Aga Khan Museum Toronto, Museum of Fine Arts Houston Islamic Arts Subcommittee, Asia Society, Texas Women's Speaker Series, and Freedmen's Town Preservation. Sultana, over to you. Thank you very much, Ratish. That was very inspiring. The work that has gone on has been unbelievably incredible. And congratulations for all the awards that you received at this for this particular site. His Highness the Aga Khan has said that the Aga Khan Trust support to historic communities demonstrates how conservation and revitalization of the cultural heritage, in many cases, the only asset at the disposal of the community can provide a springboard for social development. We have also seen how projects can have such a positive impact well beyond conservation, promoting good governance, the growth of civil society, a rise in incomes and the economic opportunities, greater respect for human rights and better stewardship of the envir environment, and especially in promoting plural values. It is very obvious that the restoration of Humayun's tomb, the Sundar nursery, and the Nizamuddin Urban Renewal Initiative has accomplished everything that His Highness has outlined. How easy or difficult was it to engage the community in the endeavor of skill building, in the masonry work, in the tile work, and in all the preservation? Also, in coordinating with all the agencies to maintain authenticity? Um, nothing we do is ever easy. Um, Zanis makes sure of that. Um, but I think, uh, and almost, and I think one of the biggest challenge in doing what we do is almost nothing of this sort has ever been done before. So there is no precedence. There is no, um, you know, there is no um, precedence to go upon. Um, but it was clear that the community was in need, but it was also clear that uh, they had their own aspirations. Um, so we had to really... Um, they were not, being an urban community, they were not going to really do work uh, which was very labor intensive, such as stone carving. And But the revival of craft for the tile work was really something they took to very well. Um, but almost, uh, almost all the uh, three and a half so thousand youth that we trained and who've, who've since then uh, found economic opportunities um, have been received training in such diverse uh, fields that one didn't imagine possible, including, um, you know, beauticians, including uh, traditional craft, but also software and hardware repair, um, electricians and plumbers. Um, so it's been, it's really, um, I think the reason it's been successful is because we went out there and tried to understand the community's aspirations. Um, so there are, um, you know, there are people who are who are salesmen, but there are also people who are now professional nurses. So it's it's a very diverse group. That's amazing. And then to maintain authenticity, how were you able to um, ensure that at every level um, it was pretty authentic in terms of, you know, 
putting all the pieces together. Yeah, so Sultana, you know, um, this is the first, and I'm sure it won't be the last, but uh, 25 years after we started, we remain the only private agency that is working, implementing conservation work of any of India's national monuments. Now that sitting in America might really surprise you because um, you know the, the government of the the government in America does not spend money um, doing music concerts. You know, you it'll, you'll find it very hard to believe that the government of India actually pays uh, cre to have musical concerts. People come and attend for free. So the liberalization in India is really not touched the culture sector and because we are the first and because we we are uh, we so far remain the only one um we were under huge amount of scrutiny international scrutiny because we were working on national monuments and world heritage sites so we really i think in the process of making sure that we are able to implement this work um, really set some very, very high standards for ourselves um, and, um, and, and emphasized on authenticity. Uh, we ensured that every piece of monument that was original was retained on the monument. But at Humayun's tomb, we had to remove 200,000 square feet of cement plaster to put back lime plaster. We removed a million kilos of concrete from the roof of Humayun's tomb. Um, so a lot of the authenticity had already got compromised. And in this case, it was really restoring the significance of the site. And which is why we had craftsmen working with the same hand tools, working with the same material that their forefathers would have used 500, 400 years ago. Amazing. Um, the site also includes several gardens. Flowing water is an essential element of the Mughal Charbagh at the Humayun's tomb, the underground terracotta pipes, aqueducts, fountains, water channels were some of the elements of the gardens. How was the water flow element introduced again? Yes, it was the heart of the heart of the uh, garden, it was the soul of the garden. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read the descriptions of the Quranic paradise, you have these four rivers of paradise. And, uh, and if you really look at uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan, you have these flowing rivers, um, which really go through settlements. And they're not, they're not ocean like Indian rivers, but they're small streams. Um, and, and, and so flowing water was a key to Timurid gardens, it was a key to uh, Central Asian gardens. Uh, but build a garden with flowing water on the plains was was a huge challenge for the Mughal builders in the 16th century. They they seem to have achieved this by including the Yamuna in the garden, the river Yamuna in the garden at Humayun's tomb, and um, and that is what we really when in um, in 2002 when His Highness came to inaugurate or complete the Humayun's tomb garden restoration. That's what it was. It was restoring flowing water. Um, the drop in level in the channels was one is to 4,000. So it's one centimeter for 40 meters. And to do that in traditional materials was a nightmare. It was, it was a significant effort. And, uh, and, and we had to make sure it was all gravity driven and so on, um, which meant that it was low to maintain in future years. And uh, to put the fountains back was a joy. And it's really because it is the soul of the garden, it led to a thousand percent increase in visitor numbers. I don't often say this, but to this audience, I can. Um, you know, we what we spent in the garden restoration, which was a gift of His Highness on the 50th anniversary of India's independence, was recovered by the Archaeological Survey of India in excess ticket sales in less than nine months. Now, which other investment has that return, rate of return? And so we are also here to demonstrate in a country like India that conservation is not a burden. It is really an asset. So in your work, in your years working at this site, what was the most difficult and what was the most rewarding? Every day, most difficult and most rewarding. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, uh, I think most rewarding is, you know, is 
um, um, comes much later. Um, I mean, I don't even want to go into what's most difficult because it's it's not even worth going there. Um, but in the sense that you know, in in less than two years, Sundarno Street is the talk of town. There's six hundred thousand people. But more importantly, that it's the only place in town where you would have a family who's just come in with a Rolls Royce and you know taken out their very posh Persian carpet and having a picnic. And right next to them is a family that's come in a cycle rickshaw and are also doing a picnic. So, and that in India, which is a very class conscious society, is you just never see it. So every sort of person is now coming to Sundar Nursery because what we've created is of interest to a diverse group of people. Uh, you know, you could be a bird watcher, you could have ecological interests, heritage interests, you could be into organic farming, you could do hundred things. So it's it's incredible to see thousands of people with three to four generations of the family coming together and reviving this craft of picnic. And the same impact we did when we worked in Nizamuddin. I mean, we, we've touched lives, we've saved lives, we've saved lives of pregnant mothers, and nothing could be more rewarding. What are your challenges in keeping up with maintaining the whole site? Yeah, I think that is also the key thing. I mean, it's uh, uh, a lot of people like today, somebody said, I've never seen any place in India that is so clean. Um, so so it's 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 a lot of supervision. It's uh, and the key thing is that over here, the team that really builds on the nursery is also now engaged to sort of maintaining it and uh, do so with a great degree of pride. Um, we understand the place. Um, we feel that uh, you know, we're fulfilling a major need in the city of Delhi. And in India, it's easier than in some other places because you can outsource a lot of maintenance as long as you supervise it. So it's, uh, um, you know, it's a simple thing that's making all the difference. So I know that His Highness always talks about a multi-input approach in um, poverty reduction. And I know that the residents of, in the Basti have really benefited from the work of um, the joint work with Sir Ratan Tata Foundation in recreating the school there. And you showed us the slides for that and that 5,000 children have gone through that, if, if not more. Um, and also the Aga Khan Foundation in adding all the ECD programs in the Basi. And then of course the toilet program and the labs. And I'm so happy to know that, uh, you know, COVID with COVID, um, that the labs, I'm, I'm sure they must have done a lot of testing and that the Basti women got together and they really monitored events to prevent the spread of COVID. That's really wonderful. But um, basically, I think that the Basti seems to have really thrived and um, has taken advantage of all the inputs as a result of this particular conservation as well. Yeah, I think uh, I think what's been key is that in a, in, when you're trying to do a, a program that is focused in a historic urban city, um, you cannot only do heritage or you cannot only do health or education. And that's been the problem of the approach in the in all the development sector. Um, so, you know, various agencies will do education, health, but nobody's thinking you're doing it all. And, and that's where we are different. Um, so in, in this this case, it's been a very AKDN uh, approach, uh, and that is why we needed these 30 different disciplines to come together. And uh, uh, so we've, 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 the key was to understand what are the community's needs, aspirations, and go in there and fulfill them, whether it's building a new school. Uh, and we've had a lot of support. We've had a support, not only the Ratan Tata Trust, but also um, you know, other Tata trusts and <clears throat> and governments and municipal corporations, both financial and technical supports, to undertake um, undertake these projects and uh, uh, the conservation effort. So I think a lot of people have seen value in what we do. And now our biggest challenge, Sultana, really is going to be um, 
to really ensure that the work that we've done is continued beyond our presence, beyond our existence, which uh, sooner or later is going to come to an end, maybe this year itself. Um, and uh, But it's been a community that's been deprived for decades, if not centuries. Um, and the real quality of life indicators were just so low um, that, you know, 10, 12 years of work goes nowhere. And COVID has really pushed all of our work back by, by at least five, six years, unfortunately, because jobs we train people for uh, are redundant. It's uh, a lot of people have been stigmatized because of the COVID outbreak in the Tablighi Jamaat headquarters. And so they've lost jobs. So a lot, lot has unfortunately gone wrong. Um, so that will remain our challenge and how we can handhold them somehow create a community-based organization which is what we're trying to do now can you also speak about the thriving handicraft program um in the musti where the women have learned incredible craft skills yeah and I so, think that... sorry we, we've created a lot of self-help groups we realized very early on that less than five percent or maybe less much less than that of women had any sort of economic opportunities. And a key to our success has really been addressing the needs of the women, whether it's women toilets, whether it's women park, whether it's women healthcare and so on. And similarly, economic opportunities for youth and women. So we've got several self-help groups which, uh, uh, which, in, which uh, engage 200 plus women in, in making paper crafts, embroidery. The reason for these is these are things they can do in the comfort of their home. They don't need to go anywhere. And often, uh, very happily, what's happened is their husbands and other family members have joined in when there have been large orders from uh, big retail chains to make notebooks or scarves or, or handbags or or something. So it's 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 again, it's something that uh, will take a lot more effort to keep it going uh, because the initiative. Um, is slightly lacking in this community. You know, the, the enterprise is quite lacking. So, so that 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 is a challenge. But for ten plus years, um, a lot of the women have become uh, the economic the providers for their families. So there is a museum coming up in the area now as well. Um, Inshallah. <laughs> all the hand all the artifacts that will be in the museum. How will they? You know, with you, I guess you'll be partnering with different organizations to be able to bring in different artifacts, um, especially yes. for that particular area. Yes. So, you know, um, uh, this is not the Aga Khan Museum. So we're not really buying or procuring objects for this. But this is the same size as the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. So it's, it's quite a big facility. Uh, it's a Humayun site museum. And, uh, you know, if I may, uh, uh, you know, the mandate from His Highness is really to talk, the guidance from His Highness is really to talk about how uh, this area was really the hub for pluralism in the 16th, 17th century. And uh, when that was first, uh, when we were first given that direction, I was like, how is that even possible? Uh, we want to talk about double domes, but sooner or later we came to realize that uh, almost everything, this was the hub of Hindustani culture. Nizamuddin was the hub of uh, really this whole Hindu-Muslim culture that North India is proud of. Uh, major poets like Khusro, Rahim, Galeb are all here as Jahanara uh, is buried here, Shah Jahan's daughter. Dara Shikho is here. So there are a lot of those sort of personalities. So the, what the museum does is it's, it, it, it talks about the significance of Humayun's tomb, which is a building without any precedent in the Islamic world. And it is the precursor of Taj Mahal. So it does talk about Humayun's tomb, but it also talks about Humayun, his kingship, how it mattered to the Mughal times, his journey. He traveled almost three times more than Marco Polo did in his lifetime. So we talk about his journey. Uh, so just to give you an idea, when we talk about his journey, we, he goes to Iran, Afghanistan. So there are objects from as far away as Iran and objects that we, we could display. Um, there are lots of miniatures which show Humayun from the National Museum collection, which uh, we've been told we will be able to display. Uh, there are a lot of architectural artifacts that have come up 
over the last two decades of our work, uh, which will be displayed, including, you know, 16th century fragments of waterfalls, uh, fountain heads recently discovered, believe it or not, um, the, you know, 18 feet tall Homayun's tomb finial. And then finally, there are a lot of architectural models uh, to show the World Heritage Site, to show how it's evolved, and lots of animations and so on. But, uh, but we have about uh, 200 objects committed by the National Museum and the Archaeological Survey of India that tell the story of Sufism, tell the story of the Mughal Empire, tell the story of the significance of Humayun's tomb, tell the story of craftsmanship, and so on. So it, it's, uh, uh, I mean, if we are able to finish it as planned, then I think it will be a major, major um, uh, gift to India on the 75th year of India's independence. And it will be something that uh, will become, uh, you know, something that all museums in India will eventually aspire to be. What other projects um, is AKTC involved with um, now in India? So, you know, we work on the invitation of the government of India. We've, we've done these two really mega projects. Uh, uh, so this is this what I presented to you is one project which we look at. It's the Mayan's tomb uh, project. And um, um, and the other thing that we've been doing almost for 10 years now is at Golconda, the Qutub Shahi tombs. Now, this is another incredible site. My last slide was on it. But over 100 monuments in one park, 106 acres. Again, when we started, there were about 18 monuments known by name. And a lot of this was just covered with vegetation, buried in the ground, and so on. So it's been, again, very rewarding, but again, very challenging uh, for very different reasons. And uh, again, some of our work is um, stuck there in various sort of litigations. Uh, but uh, um, And that is seen as a model for, uh, for South India. Again, in Hyderabad, we don't have the social economic program and so on. But we look at Hyderabad as an AKDN city. We look at Hyderabad as an AKDN city where uh, there is the Aga Khan Academy, there is the Aga Khan Health Services, the Aga Khan Education Services. The foundation comes in some once in a while to do something or the other. So it's, it's uh, on the other hand, in Delhi, it's only the Aga Khan Trust for Culture out of the, all the other AKDN agencies. So we look at uh, Hyderabad as a long-term city with a lot of AKDN investment and care. So again, a great project, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's only possible with the AKTC. Excellent. You have received numerous awards for all the work at Humayun Tombs. Congratulations to you. And thank you very much for your time today in educating us all. I know that we will all be incredibly honored to come and visit at some point in time. So we look forward to that and thank you again. Pleasure, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you Rakesh and Sultana for a truly enlightening discussion. Having the opportunity to experience such an informative conversation was a real treat. Additionally, thank you to our partners World Affairs Council of Greater Houston, Asia Society Texas, and the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce for the Greater Houston for your collaboration on this event. On behalf of the Ismaili Jamaat Kanan Center, we also want to thank each and every one of you who joined virtually from your homes across the globe. We hope that you truly enjoyed the performance. To get additional information about the Ismaili Jamaat Kanan Center, please go to the .ismaili in your web browser. And for more information on upcoming events, please go to facebook.com forward slash the Ismaili USA. We look forward to sharing programming with you. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>